In the year 731, a monk named Bede from Northumbria wrote the ecclesiastical history of the English people. This history covers the era from Julius Caesar's invasion of Britain up until his modern time in the 8th century. It's pretty much silent on anything that happens before the Romans come along to Britain. Bede intentionally does this to help cement an English national identity, to cement the political and religious motives that he has in recounting this story. Now, Bede does refer to the island prior to the Romans arriving as Albion, and the name later becomes Britannia. And this name Albion comes from the Greeks, who had already had knowledge of the island already in the 5th century, 6th century BCE. In 1136, about 400 years later, another historian, Geoffrey of Monmouth, recounts his story of the history of Britain with a focus on the kings. His work called The History of the Kings of Britain has a lot more content when it comes to the Iron Age, the period prior to the arrival of the Romans. Once again, we look at the island of Albion, but now through the lens of of a different founder named Brutus. Now, Brutus was the descendant of Aeneas, who was the cousin of King Priam of Troy. You might remember King Priam from the Iliad. After the end of the Trojan War, Aeneas escapes and lands in Italy, and there's a prophecy that one day one of his descendants will go on to great things. Well, this prophecy starts with a child killing his parents. And Brutus comes along to fulfill that prophecy by killing his parents, escaping Italy, founding the city of Tours in what was Gaul, now France, and ultimately finds his way settling on the island of Britain, which is now derived from the name of Brutus. Of interesting note, the conquest of Brutus involves overthrowing the giants who lived on Albion that were you know, 15 feet tall. Now, this shows two very different histories as we get started in our review of the history of modern politics. Welcome to the History of Modern Politics. That was Matt Whitliff, and my name is Chris Spangle, and we are so glad to have you here on the program. And this show is dedicated to giving you the history of our modern politics. And here in the beginning, we are going to take a breezy look through history and fill in the names that you've sort of heard and maybe remember from your high school history class, and ultimately ending with the historical background of the conversations that we have today in in our modern politics here in the uh, here in America. But we uh, will also dip into some foreign conversations along the way as well. Mm-hmm. So we are starting with Britain and we are starting with the Romans because we could start anywhere and anytime. We could start in uh, you know, ancient Egypt. We could start mm-hmm. in ancient Greece. But Matt, let's start with why are we starting with Britain and why are we starting with the Romans? Why, why Britain? Yeah, well, one of the key reasons we start with Britain is because if we, we look at the entire arc that we're going to study here and understanding politics in the United States today, you know, obviously the U.S. got its independence from Britain and understanding the dynamics of how America was founded and the principles there, we have to kind of go back to Britain. So when we look at starting this podcast and starting this episode in episode one, we kind of need to trace all the way back to the history of Britain. Uh, Britain is on the edge of the Roman Empire and creates an interesting dynamic of of the outer edges of the empire with the influences of the empire. Um, So it's a little bit remote, uh, but at the same time, it is fully inculcated into the rest of the dynamics that are happening politically and militarily and culturally, et cetera, as a, a descendant of the Roman Empire. Yeah, and I think it's important to start with Bede and our understanding of the early days of Britain and Geoffrey of Monmouth, because as we look backwards through the lens of history, we have to remember that we are having conversations um, based on writings, based on the viewpoints of people in their time, and they are applying their own lens to that. And and Bede is certainly, uh, he is the 
progenitor of the English idea and often cited whenever somebody is talking about the early days of Britain, they're talking about B generally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, kind of a common phrase that, uh, you know, the, the winners get to write the history books and, and that's largely true. But also when we look at older history, uh, sometimes it's just a matter of luck as to what writings or oral tradition have even survived. Um, and so, you know, Bede is one of the three key historians from this era, from a British perspective, by which we have like any content at all. And some of that is just luck in terms of what has survived, you know, fires and, and war and things like that. But also, you know, it's important to know that uh, the other combination of that is the people who kind of win, quote unquote, win and survive through history. It, it's their story that is often told the most. Um, so this study of like uh, historiography as to understanding the, the background of history and different versions of history, you know, something we need to keep in mind throughout the entire story that we're going to tell. Yeah, and Bede was writing in the late 700s and, you know, writing before Beowulf. So if you take an English history class, you read Beowulf. He, he's writing before, just before that. Um, so it, it's ancient literature, but it is almost, it, it's in the Dark Ages, but near towards the end of the Dark Ages, towards the medieval period. And we call it the Dark Ages because we don't have much writing that survived let alone any writing of, of the social history variety where we understand the average person's experience. It's really just government agents and the, the wealthy at this time who could write and were literate. And so we have to understand that as we have these conversations, in the especially in the early period of history, we're looking through a very narrow lens. And what is established fact is also often established fact from a, a very biased point of view. This is a Catholic monk who is trying to create an English um, narrative, creating a country, essentially. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in a Roman Catholicism paradigm. And that is why we chose to start with Bede. He is an interesting person. You should definitely uh, read his book. It is very interesting, very mystical um, and very biased. But, you know, you you have the Roman Empire stretching from Scotland all the way to near Persia, down to Africa. It's it's an enormous um, empire. But why was Britain conquered so late and why was it so difficult? Caesar couldn't take it. It was eventually established, as we'll hear, by later emperors. But it wasn't conquered during the Republican times. It was conquered later. Why is that? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it is is just geography, right? And with with England being on the outer edges of, of the uh, what was the growth of the republic and soon to be empire at the time, uh, it takes a little bit more manpower, a little bit more uh, ingenuity to to get across the English Channel and and bring an army across to actually invade. But then you also have. Um, you know, the, the residents of the island, right? And, uh, you know, kind of, I think history has suggested and, and has good evidence that there's a different uh, warrior-like culture that was existing on the island at time that, uh, and independence on the island at the time that, that created a more difficult people to conquer, right? So, And that, that also benefits us because we see because it, it develops so much later than other places, we see its development much more clearly because society is more literate in the, in the, uh, you know, AD era, essentially. Yeah, that that's, that's right. So, you know, as we kind of, you know, move thinking through that, like I, I think trying to understand what we do know about what the Island was like, you know, prior to the Romans arriving is, is an important place to start. Right. So we have this, you know, unique geography of it being an Island on, you know, what was the edge of the known world at this point. And there's strong evidence that, um, you know, there was connection and trade and, and activity happening with the European continent, uh, but in terms of the inhabitants, it was a, a clan-based society, lots of tribes. And, you know, by the this era in the few centuries before the Common Era, uh, it's, it's pretty well acknowledged by scholars at this point that the island was, you know, fully inhabited by uh, Celtic Britons as, as they're come to known today. So, so Chris, you know, talk to us well, about... Well, let, let's, yeah. uh, let's take a second and answer the question why we're starting with Romans and not Greeks. 
Yeah, no, great question. So, you know, through the lens of, again, the, the arc of history we're thinking about, you know, there was little to no Greek influence on the history of Britain, um, at least in the first, uh, you know, several centuries, millennia of the history of Britain and England. So it was purely a uh, influence of Rome. Uh, through its uh, re Republican culture and ultimately the imperial culture and and what came through it, um, you know the the classical antiquity of of Greece and Egypt, you know those ideas and concepts were you know largely forgotten at this point in time, and it was not until uh, you know the Renaissance era, the Age of Enlightenment, that we start to you know bring some of that writing of Socrates and Plato and and others kind of back into the consciousness and thought as to how uh, political philosophy emerged and developed. Yeah, I think it's also important to talk about the Roman Republic as a major advance in those early principles of representative government, and it spreads throughout its empire, and it it, it exported its culture in a major way, and in its, in its administrative state, its language, its religion in some cases, its destruction of other cultures. There are a lot of lessons in it for our modern day, and it's also uh, a, a modern lesson to watch the fall of the Roman Republic into the empire and how representative government can devolve into autocratic rule. So it's uh, and it's got a very multicultural um, set up. So the Roman Republic is a natural place for us to start because it isn't it isn't just localized in the Aegean Sea. It is broad across Europe, across Asia and Africa and offers so many different viewpoints. Uh, and we have so many written sources about it so yeah. we can look at it very clearly. But we need to jump back, like you said, to the British Isles and talk about the people that were there. Uh, there were people that have lived in the British Isles since the Paleolithic area. What, who inhabited Britain? Where, what's the starting point for the people of Britain before we get into the major upheaval that comes through invasion of this island? Yeah, so it is this uh, Celtic British uh, or Breton uh, peoples and, and, you know, they, there's good evidence that these people, you know, crossed over uh, from the European continent. Uh, so lots of common heritage with other Germanic and um, uh, tribal peoples that, that, you know, we later think of as the barbarians and, and Gauls and such that, uh, you, you know, Rome will go on to fight. There's so they, some there's some early um, written evidence that the channel was actually a creek at one point and that people from Scandinavia and from upper France and Germany invaded the island by able just to walking just across it. Walk across, exactly. And, and so that is the, the large thought as to what these, these folks are. So there's a strong common heritage. Uh, a, a religion has, has begun to develop here that, you know, you've, you've probably mostly heard of the Druids. So Druidism is uh, this quasi religion, pagan type of um, uh, practice that that exists among these people. And, you know, there is, like I said earlier, strong evidence of trade, especially with uh, Gaul, which is modern day France um, and and certainly the trade routes that had been established by the Greeks and, uh, and some of the other stronger cultures, there's, there's showing of evidence that um, there was connection across the continent back uh, a along a vast distance between the island. Yeah, there's, uh, there's British tin in, in Rome and other places uh, throughout the, the BC or the before the common era, as it's called now. Uh, and so that is partly why Caesar thought that it was a mineral rich island is that there was there was tin and, uh, and copper and other um, metal coming from the island. There was also, you know, an export of, of pottery, of wool. You know, we when we think of the British Isles, we often think of sheep. Uh, and so they were a very they were for many, many centuries in Britain, very dedicated to the export of clothing and fabric. And the, the idea of pagan and Celt, I think we should pause and say, you know, the, the idea of a pagan is really an invention of, or barbarian is an invention of the Roman 
superiority complex where they look <laughs> yes. down on barbarians. And the word Celt wasn't even, I've read on Wikipedia, so take it for what it's worth, that it wasn't even invented until the 17th century. And so you have, uh, in all places across the earth, you have the default setting of organization of politics with a small population. You have a tribal system, and that can take many different forms and shapes. And I think the best way to relate it to the modern listener is to think about American Native Americans. Mm -hmm. and you have many different tribes and structures of government, and they're you know they're sometimes warring, they're sometimes peaceful with each other, uh, and they they have different emphasis on how they organize their society. There's evidence in Britain that. You know, there were kings, but then there were um, councils and there were uh, completely communitarian uh, tribes. But that seems to be the the default setting in most places is the clan uh, with a C. And, it mm -hmm. should be and clan based societies have many different traits that are uh, common across the world, but specifically here. Let's talk about life in a clan-based society and what that looks like, Matt. Yeah, I mean, so when we think about a clan or a tribe, um, you know, it's really a structure of a network of family units that have come together for mutual protection, mutual benefit, um, and, and really moving past a nomadic society or a hunter-gatherer society and beginning to have some degree of um, uh, permanency in terms of location and specialization. Um, but, you know, you're still largely dependent on subsistence living, right? I mean, this is still yeah. agriculture, animal husbandry. You, you know, you're probably starting to have some specialization, but now you Short have... Short day exists to live to tomorrow. I exactly, exactly. But uh, there, there is a little bit of permanency in terms of settling into a place and um you know with your your kind of your group uh and you know these are very tightly knit multi-family organizations that are beginning to develop up and you know you mentioned kings you know they are you know typically at this point kind of elected or mutually agreed upon by the leaders and and elders of society um you know, it's it's not necessarily a hereditary claim where it's just going to pass on to the oldest son. Um, but let's not confuse this with some sort of like egalitarian <laughs> Republican form of government or, or anything like that either. Right. It is still the powerful, um, you know, by violence Praying on the less powerful <laughs> is, is, is really going to be where uh, where things sit. So there is a great book called The Rule of Clan by Mark Wiener, and I highly recommend it if you want to dive into clan government, clan culture, and you know from and he he spans the the scope of history from ancient clans to modern clans in places like Yemen and Africa to really explain this thinking and give a lot of great insight. And so his definitions: What is the rule of the clan? We read from the book. When I refer to the rule of cl the clan, I mean three related contemporary phenomena. First, and most prominently, I mean the legal structures and cultural values of societies organized primarily on the basis of kinship societies in which extended family membership is vital for social and legal action and in which individuals have little choice but to maintain a strong clan identity. So that is against the idea of individualism, right? And we will right. see in later centuries that individualism comes out of this network of judgment based on what your cousins do, right? Mm -hmm. So you you ha you don't have much of an individual identity. You have a group identity. Second, by the rule of clan, Mark Wiener uh, continues, societies founded on informal patronage networks, especially those of kinship and traditional ideals of the patriarchal family authority. Third, and most broadly, by the rule of the clan, I mean the anti-liberal social and legal organizations that tend to grow in the absence of state authority or when the state is weak. This is because under their legal principles, people are valued less as individuals per se than as members of their extended families. The rights and obligations of individuals are fundamentally influenced by their places within the kin groups to which they inescapably belong. 
So, yeah, I think that's a great summary, right? And and I yeah. think Wiener really hits it on the head in terms of giving us a, a strong definition and, and perspective of you know tying the governance structures of clans and and what life is like to be in there to you know concepts that we think about today. Yeah, and there was a guy named Henry Sumner Maine that we'll cover in later episodes who was very influential on the modern view of clan versus you know modern societies. So you know status uh, societies, and and he identifies and, and so basically you're going from status to contract societies as he outlines. He's often called the Charles Darwin of legal theory because of his evolution of you know the clan-based society the status society into the contract society and individualistic society and uh this idea where you're based on your status within a family to you're an individual contractor um he he didn't mean with the the societies of status that simply they just possess a social rank or hierarchy uh, he meant those communities in which family groups serve as the primary basis for social organization and which in which the law takes the extended family as its principal unit of concern. In these communities, societies governed by the rule of the clan, a person's social and legal role is determined by his or her place within the kinship group. For instance, the role of women in clan societies is to physically reproduce the clan itself, and this role shapes all the legal rules affecting them from their ability to sue or to be sued to their property rights. So the idea of property rights in and of itself doesn't quite exist in the default state of human organization, but we will see the need for the contract societies to evolve as population expands. And that's why the Roman Republic, Matt, is such a big leap uh, let's talk about the, yep. the Roman Republic itself. We could talk all day about Rome and the end of the Roman Republic, but we want to touch on just a few points. So as we talk in the next couple episodes about Rome, you have a greater context of what's going on. So what are some key points that we need to keep in mind with the Roman Republic? Yeah. So the Roman Republic, as you mentioned, is is a stark contrast from a lot of these uh, tribal and, and clan-based societies where you've got little pockets of people in, in these um, kinship-related ties. I mean, Rome has now certainly by, you know, 100 BCE um, and, and certainly well before that has developed into a much more structured governments uh, and, and related-based society. So, um, you know, founded around 509 BC after the uh, Rome had a kingdom in place, uh, the Republic was formed. Um, and there's a lot of innovation in the ideals, um, you know, taking, borrowing some things from uh, what we see in democracy in, in Greece, but frankly, more around a system of government government with uh, a lot of checks and balances, actually, a, a fairly complex web of positions and checks and balances with with some power back to the people, uh, you know, magistrates with with significant amounts of power. Well, uh, you, you start with the patricians and the clients. So after you leave the period of eight kings and go into the republic, it is the nobility establishing a government that gives them the majority of the power. And as they abuse their power, as power usually does, mm -hmm. you, you start to see the um, the clients and the plebes start to petition the patricians for more power. So you see things, uh, see various forms start to, to grow. So what are some of those different forms of government that became checks and balances on the power of the nobility? Yeah, so a lot of it starts with the assemblies, which are composed of the people themselves. So there, there were assemblies of the plebeians, the lower class ranks of society, and the the plebeians held power through these assemblies that were overseen by uh, a tribe, uh, uh, tribunes who were in a tribunal. Um, so it was it was the highest rank really you could achieve in Roman government as a plebeian for for most of the time to become one of the tribunes of the assembly of the plebes. Um, on the on the other side, you've got the Senate, which I think everyone's probably heard of the Roman Senate. This is largely just based on I mean, you're not elected to the Senate. <laughs> you you inherit your way into the Senate by basically being rich enough, right? So this patrician class that sits at the top of Roman society, 
um, you know, is the envy of it all. Y- you get membership into the Senate by having enough wealth and power. Uh, the Senate advises the the magistrates, and you know they are uh, the Senate itself does not hold a ton of direct influence, but they influence everything else. All the checks and balances kind of run through the Senate in this regard. And then the magistrates are individual offices uh, for people to, you know, um, preside over various uh, levels of religious, military, judicial powers. Um, so at the very top of that, you have the consul. Uh, there are two consuls at any time. They are elected by the Senate. So that is the top magistrate. You can only hold uh, a one-year term and you cannot serve consecutive terms, right? So this was intended and designed to be a protection against uh, somebody retaining too much power. The next for, level down. For 10, yeah. for 10 years, you could only be a consul for 10 years. One year at a time, actually, at, at the beginning. So oh, you were right. one-year terms, yeah. Yeah, and you then, had one-year terms, but I'm saying the consul, you serve as a consul, you couldn't serve as consul again for 10 years. So like, uh, yes. you know. So there, there were term limits, essentially. Exactly. And then and then next level down is you have the Praetor, uh, who, who's like one step below the council, and they typically have um, uh, judicial authority and have the ability to command a military, to have a military compand, a command, which is you know very important in Roman society, especially as you move through the centuries and Rome becomes much more militaristic. Um and then we mentioned the, you know, the tribunes and the senates before. The other key term to probably know here, if we're you know in a limited amount of time, is a dictator. And the senate could elect, believe it or not, elect a dictator <laughs> under extreme emergencies and give full emergency powers, uh, bypassing all of the constitutional safeguards and protections in a period of emergency. And then it was intended that you know once that emergency passes the dictator steps down. Yeah, it isn't until through the history of Rome for centuries, they would form armies to fight threats that that might, let's say the Etruscans are trying to invade the city of Rome. And so, you know, the there would be a dictator that would form an army and then they'd go fight and then like good old Cincinnatus return to their farm and uh, not fight anymore. And that evolves you know, war is the enemy of the state or it, it, of a healthy state. And uh, no, war is the enemy of freedom, I should say. Uh, and you'll see that change. So if if you've ever watched the TV show Rome on HBO, have you seen it, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. So I just was, I'm just in the middle of rewatching it. So the way to think about it is you've got your Caesar, Mark Antony and Pompey, and they're the consuls, you know, the Cicero's, that upper class. And then your your magistrates, in, like Varinus, gets elected the magistrate of Aventine Hill, a district, and becomes basically like the arbiter of justice. And, oh, my, you know, my swamp, my sewer isn't working. Can you send somebody out? Uh, and then the Tribune is, uh, you know, uh, a member of the plebeian classes assemblies. And so it's important to keep those distinctions in mind because the norms start to break down in the next piece. So how does Rome start to erode yeah. and how do these norms start to break down? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to, to, you know, putting that on the path is, you know, they would organize the military largely in defense, but as those tastes of glory began to happen and uh, wars got bigger and the territory of the Republic starts to grow, that, ability to become rich, become powerful, <laughs> become loved by the people. Uh, it, it's a tough, that thirst uh, in, in human nature is, is kind of tough to put down. So, you know, the first, I, I think, you know, critical turning point that we want to cover here is it's after Hannibal and the Punic Wars and all this. Now we're moving into around 100 to 120 uh, BCE, there are two brothers, the the Gracchi brothers, um, who come from from the plebeian ranks and hold uh, hold title as as one of the tribunes on the on the and the assembly, and they 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 start accelerating the norm breaking. Right, they are seeking much more power on behalf of the plebeian class, really fighting to break down the the boundaries and and the rules and. Uh, and distribute wealth, right? I mean, the the wealth, the the land ownership is full, almost fully still sitting with the patrician class. 
Uh, and they start using populism and violence and mob rule to get what they want. And in, in, in the spirit of trying to reform land law, land law. They, they are often seen because the people who write the history that you read now were, you know, generally nobles and patricians in the 18th and 19th century leading to uh, a lack of scholarship for your textbook. <laughs> they're often seen as enemies because they're, they're fighting the nobles of the time and the patrician class, but they had some points. Uh, they had some points like, you, why, why not open up the land if we are a land-based economy and wealth is determined by land and your ability to profit off of that land you can't harbor all of it and keep it for yourself and not allow upward mobility. This is another common theme of history, upward mobility. And so they really whipped up the uh, plebeians into a frenzy and threatened with uh, mob violence, basically the Senate to allow their reforms to pass. And they got killed for it. The first yeah. brother uh, got killed because he wanted to uh, serve as a tribune twice, two years in a row, which was not done, as we said. And so he gets elected tribune, and the senators basically uh, send out, uh, it was Tiberius was the first yeah. brother. Right? Tiberius uh, basically gets killed and thrown in the river, and 300 senators, I think it was, die. I mean, it was like a crazy day of mob violence. And yeah. uh, then Gracchus comes along about uh, 10 years later, and does the same thing, gets elected tribune twice, nobody blinks, because the norm has been broken. The most maorium, the political norm in Rome, has been broken, and so then they're off to the races. This is all outlined beautifully in the book The Storm Before the Storm by Mike Duncan, also of the History of Rome podcast. Um, but the really the, the next two guys are the big norm breakers. Marius, specifically, is a general in Rome, and what are some ways that he really just completely destroyed the, the traditions of politics in Rome? Yeah, well, he began creating armies and, and you know, broke the norm of not having standing armies, right? So he, he creates a professional military class that uh, where it is now your job, it is your profession uh, to be in the army. And that creates a level of loyalty to Marius amongst his troops that is, you know, unparalleled. Uh, and, and through that and through his power as also a populist, um, you know, he doesn't get elected consul just twice or even three times. He's he's elected consul six times in a row, like completely breaking the, the yeah. norms and the rules of the day. Eventually he gets a second. Um, yeah, but that, that idea of the armies, the people who hold the the uh, the monopoly of violence, the monopoly of force are no longer beholden to the the people, to the state, the idea of the state in Rome. They're beholden to a single person was absolutely earth-shattering. And everybody else, so we've talked a lot about this in recent history, you know, you break the norm and it doesn't go that far. What does the person who is more organized, more violent, what do they see when there are no punishments for breaking that norm? Yeah, they've you got the green light. <laughs> yeah, you, you also see a tremendous amount of violence. So as, you know, the the it, it's like street violence initially, but then once Marius comes along and Marius and Sulla and Pompey and all these people are, are ping-ponging power, they come in and they kill their opponents who supported the other side and take all their wealth. Yeah. And they gain in wealth, they gain in status. And then the other guys bring their army in, kill them and take their all, all their supporters lit. And so you have a, 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 a rapid accumulation of wealth in the nobility because of uh, the nobility dying. So that also plays into the fall of the Roman Republic. Sulla, though, is a guy that many people have not heard of but was particularly norm-breaking and uh, really Caesar gets the credit for breaking the Republic. But in my mind, I don't know about you, Arius and Sulla seem way more responsible for it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the avalanche, I think, that starts, you know, having all the rocks fall downhill, right? So Sulla is really the uh, conservative, if you will, slingshot reaction in the other direction against the populist uh, tide of Marius. So, so Sulla, you know, with the 
uh, elite behind him, you know, in the name of trying to restore the Republic, uh, sweeps in and, and takes dictatorial power. And, you know, the, the civil wars just start up. Right. And so yep. the, the massive norm that he breaks is he actually marches his army into Rome. Right. Which was that was the the quintessential no, no, you absolutely could not do that is, is bring your troops into the city of Rome. But, um, he, he does march in there and, uh, you know, to, to fight his battles, right. And, and swipe, sweep away the, uh, the populist emergence that, that Marius has put into place. And so, you know, this is really the, the begin of the massive decline. Uh, and all through this, you have, Slave wars uprising, you know, you've all heard of Spartacus. This this is the era now of Spartacus. His army, uh, slave army, was was the last, one of the last, um, you know, big attempts to try to thwart what was going on amongst the uh, the Roman elites that were, were holding them down. But he's defeated by Crassus, who we'll learn about more briefly in, in the next episode. And this is where, you know, the great military power of Pompey, once again, another name you'll know soon, uh, you know, starts emerging as just an um, um, an amazing military mind, and uh, because of the culture of you know military victory and dominance that is now per- pervasive in Rome at this time is is just loved by by all the people as well. So I think that's a good place to stop, and we will talk more in the next episode about Pompey and Crassus and uh, Marius's nephew Julius Caesar and uh, how the. The Republic got officially killed. So stay tuned. We'd love for you to join us in the next episode. If you learned something, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. And we would love for you to recommend this podcast. And please go subscribe in the uh, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, everywhere that you listen to podcasts. And visit historyofmodernpolitics.com. You can get uh, the shows emailed to you, get all the show notes, get our reading lists, watch video. If you sign up as a member at historyofmodernpolitics.com. So with that, we say thank you, Matt. Thank you. My name is Chris. And we will see you again next episode.